So recently, somebody uh, said they had a bunch of video stuff that I might be interested in, uh, you know, some to buy, some to borrow, et cetera, et cetera. And among the things they had, well, I'll show you. It's a piece of equipment that I thought was a lot smaller than it actually is. This right here is a NewTek TriCaster. And the reason I've got this Amiga 4000 sitting on top of it is because these are actually brothers, or well, I guess this one's kind of its grandfather. Now you might be familiar with the Amiga, and you might be familiar in particular with the Video Toaster, which was a, a four input live production switcher and effects processor that is probably one of the best known pieces of hardware surrounding the Amiga ecosystem. Everyone knows about these things. They were used all throughout the early and mid 90s, all these television shows, MTV productions, probably public access cable and everything. And uh, in fact, they used one of these for all the transitions throughout, I think the whole run of home improvement, I think is what I heard. Look at all these wacky you know, effects you can do, you know, the, the woman who dances across the screen to transition from one scene to another and whatnot. This is that. And it's a fairly unassuming piece of gear, but well, it grew up. This here, about 25 years later, is what the video toaster became, more or less. It's the same company, does basically the same thing. It just does uh, well, a lot more of it. The uh, video toaster just has uh, four little dinky inputs. I, I think this is a flyer card, um, which uh, upgrades it a little bit, but well, it doesn't really hold a candle next to uh, the end of the line. And in fact, this isn't even the end of the line, I don't think. I can't be sure, because here's the gimmick with this video. I don't know anything about this. <laughs> The TriCaster is something I've heard about at a distance for years and years and years. I know they get used throughout a lot of video productions, sort of small, medium. I don't know about large. I don't, I don't think they quite make it up to network television scale. Maybe though, I can't really say. Because I didn't research this. I didn't have time. <laughs> this is only gonna be here for about a day. And I, I thought it was gonna be a lot smaller. So I thought I was gonna be able to borrow it, mess around with it, make a video whenever I had time, and then ship it back. And uh, this person arrives and unpacks it out of this gigantic flight case. And I'm like, wait a minute, why does it need a box that big? Until they get inside and well, yeah, it's a little bigger than I thought it was. Yeah, so uh, the TriCasters I'm familiar with, they're shuttle PCs. They're, they're like little tiny mini ITX systems. They just have uh, a couple ports on the back, much like that Amiga did. This guy on the other hand, this uses like a, I don't know if it's like a Core i7 or what, but it uses an Intel desktop board. It's got a full-size GPU in there, but then it's also just got this massive input-output array that's all built out of custom circuitry, I think. Uh, hard drive dock in the front. And of course, well, <laughs> this is the control surface. And this is similar to what you'd find in an Honest to John television studio. And I'm gonna explain how some of this works. I've never run one of these things professionally. Uh, I've just done it, you know, dinking around here in the studio just for fun. I know all the principles. I've taught myself how to run a slightly larger, slightly more professional maybe version, but I've never actually touched one of these things. It just showed up and I'm like, well, I've got maybe an hour, maybe a couple hours to mess with this because I've got other stuff going on. So come along with me. We'll mess around on it together. Now, since I haven't done any research, I don't know what this can do. Uh, I think it's capable of HD, but I don't know how. So all these ports back here, these are labeled YPBPR. Well, so that's obviously analog component video, but it also says YC on these two. Now that's colloquially known as S video, and that only came in a standard definition form. So I know that this can switch standard definition content for sure which is convenient because most of what I have here is standard definition. I don't have a lot of HD sources, but it also has this row here that says SDI. Now that's a digital interface, that's serial digital interface, but there's a bunch of varieties of it. The original one, which is colloquially known as SD SDI now, that one was limited to SD, but they made a later version, HD SDI, which has been very common for a very long time. This is definitely of the era where it should support it. So. I might have some HD SDI sources that I can plug in there, not really sure. But like I said, I've got plenty of standard definition stuff, so I'm mostly gonna mess with that. 
So I've got a monitor set up here uh, to see the interface on the device. Uh, these two PVMs here are gonna be my preview and program monitors. I'll explain how that works. This big boy here is gonna show you what the actual program output from this is. Uh, and then this is gonna be one of our video sources here. Let's get this guy set up. If I didn't have it backwards, That's a lot better. Let's get a nice shot out the window here. All right, so we have a camera and then we'll have a VCR and then maybe an HD SDI camera, who knows. But first we need to actually get this thing up and running. So let's get the control board in place. This just hooks up with USB and then let's get the unit itself hooked up. Now this is just an ordinary Windows PC for the most part, so just need to give it power. Uh, there's two power supplies here. I don't know if it needs both or if it'll run on one. Let's find out. Uh, let's hook this monitor up. Now there's an HDMI port on here, but I'm guessing that's just for the monitor. I don't think you can put a video signal in through there. I guess we'll find out. And I think we're ready to go. Let's see. Oh, oh, he's mad. Oh, good, I'm gonna need this guy. All right, there's our second power cable, and now should be a lot happier. Hopefully we get a picture here. Oh, probably best if I plugged in a keyboard, huh? You know, you'd think the board would have a USB port on it, but no dice. Yeah, so I suspect that HDMI port is not the video output. Maybe you're supposed to use the DVI. There we go. It's a DVI only. I have no idea what this HDMI port does. Anyway, here's our local interface and I'm just gonna have to log in here. Fortunately, the person who loaned this to me gave me the creds, otherwise this would be a very short video. Okay, good, I was able to log in. I can't show you what's on the screen because there's uh, like personal identifying information on here. Uh, it's okay, don't worry, you'll get to see stuff. Okay, so there's a bunch of stuff on here, but I am just gonna set up a new session. Okay, so this supports 1080i, uh, so presumably that's 1080i60, like normal US system broadcast resolution and frame rate. And then it supports 1080p30 and 1080p24. And I'm trying to picture what exactly you use those for. I, I guess if you're doing effects for uh, like a movie, I suppose you could use this for it. Uh, but anyway, since we have to pick a format, I guess I'm just gonna put this in 480i mode. I think I got the PII out of the way, so. All right, so this is what the interface looks like. And we can either, yeah, we can, so we can take uh, like various external assets and put them in here in order to call them up during a show. I won't mess with that right now. Um, and then we can uh, actually design graphics on here. Pretty typical stuff for modern uh, live switchers. We can just go ahead and start live production. Okay, so we're up into the switcher interface now. Um, I had to make a, a new project and skip all the in-between because there was a bunch of like personal identifying information on the screen, but uh, this looks like it should be clean. So what we have here is uh, basically a layout of all of our possible inputs. So on the back of the machine, we've got eight video inputs, camera one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So all those inputs are gonna be visible at all times so you know exactly what's going to potentially come up if you hit camera input one, two, three, four, Etc. Then we've got a couple of network inputs. Um, now I'm told this thing predates the new tech uh, network interface, NDI. Uh, apparently this is some sort of uh, predecessor to it. Don't know exactly what protocol it uses. Then we have uh, DDR1 and 2. I believe those are local, uh, basically digital playback. So you can put video clips in there, uh, graphics, that sort of thing, and then call those up as a source. Uh, we have a still input, and I think that's just another input that's only used uh, for local still graphics. Uh, we have a title input, which I'm assuming is for the built-in title generator. So you can quickly put simple graphics on the screen. Maybe complex graphics, I don't know. Uh, and then we have an FX. I couldn't even begin to guess what that one's for. Uh, I've not seen that on the uh, devices I've worked with so far. Presumably that comes from an internal effects generator, but I don't know what its capabilities could be. Again, never looked at a manual, don't know anything about this. The most I know about this is that Giant Bomb, for all their pre-pandemic productions, were using one of these. And I don't even know if they were using the big one. I do know that it crashed all the time. In fact, I think I heard that this one caught fire at least once. But it's good now. Don't worry about it.
So now this is a, basically the virtual panel. It's reflecting uh, what's going on on the master panel here, essentially. Uh, but you can presumably just select stuff with the mouse. Let's see if that's true. Yep, yep. Besides the camera inputs, uh, next to that we have the preview and program inputs. Now I'm planning on doing a big video where I tear down exactly how a vision mixer works, which is funny because I've never worked on one of these professionally, but the concepts are fairly straightforward uh, and the people I've talked to who have worked on them professionally say that I understand it correctly, so we'll just trust that I get it right. Let's take a look at the board here for a moment. So this board shows you pretty much everything you need to know about what's going on inside this switcher right now. It's telling you all the current inputs and outputs for everything. So these strings of buttons going across here horizontally, these are called buses. And all video switchers, other than like really low-end consumer ones from the 80s, are gonna have at least two buses. And those are program and preview. Now, program is the most important bus in the world because on the back of this box is a jack labeled program. That's our product. That's what actually goes out to the world. That's either gonna go into a television broadcast transmitter, or it's gonna go to a videotape recorder. And it's possible to overlay things on top of what's selected on the program bus, but you should generally assume that whatever button is pressed there, that's what the world has seen. So if I press camera one, most likely what's gonna show up on your television is camera one. The preview bus is for choosing what's going to appear on the program next, generally speaking. So I can have camera one selected here and camera three selected there. And back up on the screen, those would appear in the preview and program positions. And that means that I can look at what's actually going out to the world right now, and I can look at another feed that I'm interested in that I'm probably about to switch to. So this interface is showing us all of our possible options, what we're about to switch to, and what is actually going out live. Pretty much the job of a video switcher is to switch. So those are the most important things. What is going out and what's about to be going out and what could be going out. And then everything else that's on this board lets us elaborate on that. We have all these extra buses on here that are for selecting video inputs to be fed into effects generators and uh, further compositors and things like that. And then uh, presumably uh, there's controls on here somewhere for an upstream or downstream here. Oh yeah, there they are right there. These are for picking overlay signals that are gonna be superimposed on the image. Uh, then you've got your media player controls over here. And then of course you've got the star of the show for anybody who looks at one of these, the transition control. This is the T-bar that you use to fade from one input to another. But all that stuff is just decorations around the idea of selecting inputs. All right, so we're gonna need some inputs. Let's go ahead and uh, get a camera hooked up here. All right, we wanna do sync one, that up to our video output. All right, now we should be able to just plug this right in input number one here. No picture. Why would there be no picture? Because I plugged into the SDI jack, that's why. So I can't seem to get any input here, and I wonder if uh, I need to select an input format. Go to camera one here, go to settings, input settings, we're set to, ah, SDI, that's the problem. That sure looks like black and white, but it's not. It's just not very colorful outside right now. Okay, so we're gonna need a preview monitor, which will be this guy here. And then on the back, we should have video out, one, two, and aux. Most likely those are routed preview and then program. It's probably on output number two. It's not uncommon on video switchers uh, to be able to actually route your output so you can say, oh, camera one always goes to uh, monitor number one rather than program and preview being fixed on those outputs. Sometimes you're okay with just what's on the computer monitor. So these aren't labeled program and preview, but I'm guessing that's how they're configured. And that appears to be the case because there's my program output. And then if I hit camera one on the preview bus, uh, I don't get anything. Okay, so they're not wired up like that. Okay, there we go. Just had my TV plugged in incorrectly. Let's go ahead and get you a program output. That's probably gonna be this one here. Let's find out if that's true. Program, two, yep, there we go. So for instance, if I go to the preview bus here and pick two, that's the same picture on both TVs. The preview monitor should be blank right now. It's still not being routed correctly. Yeah, it's a software setting. I just don't know how to change it. Internal monitors, that doesn't do it. External monitors, nothing there. Oh, how do we do this? 
So the question was, can I figure out how to run one of these things in an hour? And in 22 minutes, I have not figured out how to set up a preview output. So that's kind of concerning. All right, I had to resort to the manual. It's in a very strange place, but I got the configuration working. So now we've got our preview bus, which controls the first TV there. And we have our program bus, which controls the second TV and this guy here. So now we're ready to broadcast. We've got our basic setup now. We've got our preview and our program. If I select a different preview input, it changes that TV only. And if I select a different program input, it changes that TV only. So uh, these are the, the fundamentals. And now we can make some television. Uh, so if I just grab this T-bar here and pull, it's going to transition from what's on the first bus to the second bus, which is, of course, nothing. Now, when we get to the end of it, you'll notice if you pay attention to these buttons, they switch places at the end of each transition. So that, that way, you don't end up at the end of the transition uh, with the same input on both buses. So when we go like this, camera one is now on the preview where I can mess around with it if I'm, I'm going to do something to it, overlay something onto it or whatever. I can experiment with putting different overlays on here or adjusting the image, however, uh, without it showing up on the program output, which right now would ideally be another camera. So I've got a VCR under this TV. Let's plug that in. Let's plug that into camera input number two. All right, let's switch two on the program bus. And then I have to set this input up for composite. All right, and there we go. So now the VCR is playing out through the preview and the program, but if I switch the preview over, now we've got the camera feed. And now we can smoothly fade between the two on the program output. Now we can do lots of stuff other than just fades. Uh, for instance, if we set this to this button here, that should be transition. And if I pull the bar now, Okay, it looks like it's still just a fade, but that's actually what's called a dip to black because in the middle, it's completely black. So we turn off one signal before we bring up the other one. In a normal fade, we would just cross fade directly between them. Now, we don't have to use the T-bar. Uh, we can also uh, hit this take button, and that's just going to switch between the inputs, or we can press auto, and that's going to automatically smoothly fade from one to the other. My understanding is that 99% of the time, you're going to be pressing this take button. It does most of the everyday duty. So these are the absolute basics. And right now, I could run a TV program out of this. So I'd say as far as is the TriCaster intuitive to someone who knows how this stuff works, um, yeah, I think so. Uh, other than having to look up how the output bus was routed, I got all that turned up without having to look at a manual. And honestly, it turns out if I just poked one more button in the user interface, I would have found that anyway. And this is enough to run a basic television program. If you don't want any advanced transitions or anything, you can plug eight cameras uh, or you know, VCRs or whatever you've got into the back of this thing and just switch between them. That's your program. You got your fades. Uh, and that's what most ordinary television uses. If you're doing like a talk show, you wouldn't need anything more than this. But now if we want to get into the more advanced stuff, well, that's a rabbit hole because <laughs> there are millions of ways to do everything else that this can do and those are all going to require poking around the user interface. So for instance, um, let's see if we can get an on-screen graphic going here. So up here we've got this little joystick. Uh, this is labeled positioner and you can generally use that to uh, basically shrink down a video signal and overlay it on the screen in a position of your choosing. So you can do stuff like, you know, picture in picture. Now the question is, how do we get a signal into it? Now we've got this overlay bus. It seems like overlay could be for the on-screen graphics, but if we pick something, uh, okay, there's nothing there. Uh, yeah, and actually I'm kind of impressed because uh, I've worked with these things uh, a couple times before and I really can't proceed at all without checking the manual. Like the basics, no problem at all. And then as soon as you get past that, I can't figure out how to do anything else. Every other button I press just does nothing. So let's go back to the manual. You know, I want a third video input. So let's put this guy down here and get some cables. You know, let's plug that into camera number three. All right, camera three, we've got a picture. Let's rotate that thusly. All right, how's that look? Well, that sure is my belly. It's just to get that hiked up a little bit. Well, that's a little better. Let's hike it up a little bit further. There we go. All right, so now we've got inputs one, two, and three. And now if I come back to input one, uh, and then I go to 
the DSK, which I set up here on the screen. You can't apparently do it from the board as far as I can tell. Um, I can press DSK1 take, and now that looks like it's replaced the screen, but if I go to the joystick here, I can scale that down and put it wherever I want. And I can do DSK2 take, and I can scale that down, put it wherever I want. And now we've got two pictures inside the picture. Uh, you can actually also you know, like rotate these. Whoa, I didn't know it was gonna do that. You can rotate it in three dimensions. I'm rotating it effortlessly in my head. I'm not sure why you'd wanna do that, uh, but we can do that. Uh, and you can even crop it. Uh, you can just live crop in any direction you want. Anyway, I hit reset on that and reset on that. And then I can put this wherever I like. And then we've got buttons over here. Let us do uh, transitions on the DSKs. So if I hit this one, it'll fade that out. If I hit this one, it'll fade that out. So these guys here control the uh, DSKs, uh, the downstream keyers. So you can select which transitions you want when you hit the auto button. So if I hit this guy here, for instance, and then I hit the transition button, that's going to slide in from the bottom, actually sort of compress in from the bottom. So now we can hit the auto take button and it'll wipe in or wipe out. And then this third one down here that says background actually refers to the primary transition that'll be used uh, when you hit the, the master auto button on here. So if I set that to fly in, then we fly in. And I'm guessing there's just like an endless set of transitions in here. Yeah, expand in from center. If we hit the uh, edit button here, browse, I'll bet, oh boy, howdy, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few of them. Ah, yeah, we've got uh, windshield wipes, if you will. Oh, but then we've got all the stored ones. This is where we get into all the, uh, the classical sort of video toaster ridiculous stuff. Uh, oh yeah, there we go. That's what you want. Let's go to the new tech section. Yeah, let's get that powered by TriCaster. Here we go. Yeah, outstanding. That looks great. 69 minutes. Nice. Now, obviously we could just spend all day on these transitions. Uh, and in fact, you can do them manually. So if you just grab the T-bar and pull, you can do it at whatever rate you want. And then you can just stop in the middle if you want. Uh, there we go. I'm back here. Help, I'm trapped in the TriCaster logo. I'm sure that's not the first time somebody's yelled that in a control room. Uh, oh, sports, we gotta have the sports ones. Here we go, bam. Whoa, <laughs> that's actually kind of dope. Uh, let's, let's try that again with an actual destination. There it is. All sports transitions are extremely funny. We cannot miss the basketball one. That's gonna be outrageous. Oh, that wasn't actually all that good. I think, the, I think there was a basketball one on the original video toaster that was actually better than that. Score! That actually was not a bad transition. Uh, now, if I recall correctly, these are properly called stingers, I think is the term. Um, I'm a little unclear on it because I think the first stingers, or at least very basic ones, like the ones that are supported on my other video mixer uh, that I'm more used to, are just static images that just fly across the screen and they're meant to hide a typical like band wipe. Uh, so instead of just um, wiping from one image to another, you have something covering up the wipe so it looks like the basketball replaced the image. But in reality, it's just an on-screen graphic floating over an ordinary, easy to implement wipe. Again, we can actually uh, T-bar that right to the middle. So if we'd like to, uh, to just, if we'd like to just enjoy the score text for a while, we can do that. Now, again, I've never worked in the industry, so I don't fully understand why you'd ever want to do that. Like, it seems very strange to me. I mean, maybe there's some stingers out there where it makes sense, where you might pull to the middle, freeze for a bit, and we're ready to continue, continue. In addition, you can actually do that with the auto wipe. So uh, you tap this, and then hit it again and it'll freeze where it is. And you can have it finish at the correct frame rate. And of course, at any time, uh, you can actually adjust the rate uh, right here. Let's see if that works. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> oh man, that's a really slow score. <laughs> that's a really fast score. There we go. We don't have time to dwell on it, right? The game's gotta keep going. <laughs> oh, we can ping pong it too. Oh, nice. So that means we do this and then it reverses when you go the opposite direction. So you can actually set this up so that when we go one direction, it swipes that way, and when we go the other direction, it swipes back. 
How cute is that? Uh, and of course, you can also just reverse it so that it always swipes in the opposite direction, which I actually think, I kind of think that looks better. So I would probably run that transition in reverse. Now, what I love about vision mixing gear, uh, really with most professional gear, is that it's no nonsense. So they, I mean, this definitely is not the most expensive uh, or uh, even most featureful video mixer in the world, uh, I'm sure by far, uh, but the interface still really doesn't stop uh, anywhere where they could have gone a little bit further to make it a little bit better, uh, as far as, as I can tell. Maybe if I was a pro, I would think this interface was absurd. Uh, maybe I would think that it just was missing all sorts of features that I really desperately needed to do my job. But as somebody who's never been in that position, this looks ridiculous compared to any normal piece of consumer software. For instance, um, these interfaces here uh, for picking the various transitions, uh, these are all basically preset slots. So instead of these being the presets and then having one slot or, or having to go to browse every time I want to pick one to use, um, I can replace any one of these in place. So if I come in here and pick basketball, I can just put it in that slot. And honestly, it might be possible to rapidly access those transitions from the board here if I was properly trained, but it has a 600 page manual and every single page is dense with information. So that's not gonna happen in the couple hours that I have here. And I mean, honestly, there's a ton of features on here that I don't understand at all. So there's a thing called live set, not the faintest idea what that is, virtual input delegates, I have no idea what those do. Uh, the media player, I understand. Let's see if we have any media on here uh, that's safe for public consumption. All right, I quickly got some footage here. So I've got these loaded into the media library and I should be able to basically, um, you know, put a tape in the VCR as it were. How do we do that? Do we drag it? Uh, or you know what, actually this, uh, the tab says DDR1, so we might just be going already. Let's see, I'll just press play. Oh yeah, there we are. Uh, it's the portion of the Sprite Tapes video where the guy is uh, uh, damn near naked. Uh, let's try something else. Let's see, can we load a Gibbs video here? No, that's in a format it doesn't like. Let's try Big Buck Bunny. Well, there we go. It may be open source, but it is at least playing. So anyway, um, we can now treat that as if it were a camera source. We can basketball into and out of it. And I've actually got, this is cute, I've got audio levels over here. Uh, I didn't know it was gonna do that. Probably if I put audio in, because this apparently will, will switch audio as well, which I didn't know uh, was, I didn't think it was a common feature on these things. Um, presumably it would show me the levels over here as well. Uh, and then they go away as soon as there's no levels, apparently. Now, one thing I'm wondering, um, let's go back to uh, the Sprite tape here. Now, presumably, down here at the bottom, I can scrub within the video, so I can just drop the needle wherever I want. So now um, I've got the Sprite Tape video and it has a blue background. And if you watched my video about those, uh, you, know, you may realize this is not a great chroma key backdrop, but I wonder, we can probably pull a key on this uh, and superimpose it on something. So I don't know the faintest idea where to begin with that. <laughs> probably need to go consult the manual. Five hours later. Okay, I read the manual. It took a while, but I figured it out. Uh, so I've got uh, the guy in digital player one. So what we do is we put the program output on V1. So now we're on the virtual scene, I think they call it. And there's two layers here, an A and a B. So I've got the B uh, set to the camera feed from outside. And then uh, the overlay, the A bus, I can set that to the video player. And now if we go into the settings on the video player and just grab the color picker here and drop it, bam, there we go. And there we go. Uh, he's Matt, oh, <laughs> there's the director. Now. Uh, what's remarkable about this to me is when I was making uh, the video in question uh, about the sprite tapes, I said that uh, this room was a terrible chroma key environment, but it turns out that this thing is actually handling it like a champ. Like it's not perfect, it needs some tuning, uh, but it's not half bad. And what's really fun about this is uh, I can use the positioner here and attach that to the, the virtual scene, and then I can put them wherever I want. So we can put this on crop, Crop that down, there we go. Cinch that in on the side a little bit. I can't quite figure out how to cinch in the right side. Uh, but now if we can uh, position and scale, we can put him right there. And now he's, he's, just, he's pointing out off the roof there. Uh, let's, let's roll this back. Uh, here we go. There, and then we can, just, we can just put him, he's out there sitting on the, on the air conditioning ductwork. 
There, that looks even better. There we go. Slam beef chest is just hanging out on the ventilation ducts uh, outside my place of business. It's, it's so nice to be visited by a real star. Let's see what other scenes we can put him in. Uh, scale him down a little bit. And uh, there we go. He's, <laughs> he's going to show us how to use Microsoft Office. Microsoft. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Uh, you remember when you used to be able to get those uh, like desktop agents, like the little creature that would hang out? <laughs> I couldn't have planned this. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We can even. Oh, he can hang out here. Oh, man. He is walking towards me purposefully. <laughs> So I can spend the rest of the day playing with this thing. There's so much you can do with it. Uh, I didn't want to make a comprehensive tutorial on how to use uh, video switchers or anything. Uh, but it's just, it's cool to me that the stuff in this industry uh, is based on like standards, de facto standards that go back so far that uh, with only a couple references to the manual for like fairly advanced features, I was able to figure out pretty much the whole thing uh, right off the bat. You know, it really only took me maybe a total of like 10 minutes of dinking around and the rest was just explaining what I was doing. So this is this has been a lot of fun and I really, really wish this thing was mine to keep, but all it means is I'm gonna have to put some eBay saved searches together for TriCasters and see if I can't get myself one. So I hope you had a good time uh, just hanging out and uh, figuring something out with me. Uh, it's been a long time since I had an opportunity to do a video like this. And uh, it's just, it, it's so hard to, commit to doing something unscripted where you don't know what's going to happen uh, when my usual thing is uh, making sure everything is, is so tightly controlled and everything uh, uh, perfectly scripted. And then for this, it's like, well, I literally don't have time. I can either do a video about this thing or no video at all. Hopefully in the future, I'll do a more comprehensive one once I have one of my own. For the time being, uh, I just want to thank everybody for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, let me know if you're into this sort of thing. Maybe I'll go back to trying to do sort of more freeform videos like this. I think people have really been liking the scripted stuff I've been doing, so I've been kind of sticking to that. I just almost pulled all my stuff off the table. That's what happens when you're unscripted. But there's honestly a lot of stuff that I haven't been able to fit into a scripted format because there's just so much to it. So I don't know, maybe that'd be a better way to do it. I wanna thank uh, the individual who brought this by. I don't know if they wanna be named, uh, but I'm really grateful to you for letting me borrow this for a couple of days. Uh, I had a blast just in the couple hours I had. Uh, and if uh, you ever end up up here again, uh, I'd love to spend a few more hours with it. And I'd also like to thank all the people who were supporting me on Patreon, uh, because uh, while this may have been a loan, uh, this place isn't. So thank you so much to everyone who's been supporting me, everyone who's uh, contributing on there. I couldn't do this without you. And to everyone else, thanks for watching.